Um, um, let's say good morning. My name is uh, Stephen Hodder. I'm uh, um, the president here at the RBA, um, and I'm delighted to welcome you to um, this year's Royal Gold Medal Student Crit, uh, um, a wonderful event that brings together um, the RIBA's oldest and most prestigious awards. Um, the President's Medals, uh, which date back to the oldest uh, awards actually, that date back to 1836, reward the best student uh, work produced by schools of architecture worldwide in three categories. We have the Dissertation Medal for the best written work submitted at either Part 1 and 2, uh, the Bronze Medal for the best design project at Part 1, and of course the Silver Medal for the best design project submitted for Part 2. Uh, today, the uh, President's Medals, which were awarded um, here at the RIBA two, two months ago now, it's a wonderful evening, um, uh, will be, they'll be presenting their work to our panel, which has our distinguished guest, the 2014 uh, Royal Gold Medalist, Joseph Brickwork. And, uh, and I hope I speak for everyone in the, in the room that we're delighted to have Joseph with us. Um, he's a celebrated architect, critic and historian, uh, whose work has changed the way modern architects and planners think about cities and buildings. Over a 60-year period, Joseph has written numerous influential works of architectural <coughs> criticism and history and taught some of the most eminent architects and academics, including Daniel Liebskin, David Leatherbarrow, Eric Parry, Moshe Mustafavi, and Robert Tavener, to name but a few. Um, we are also joined today by Dr. Alexander Stara, uh, who is a reader in history and theory um, of architecture at Kingston University um, and the chair of the President's Medals Dissertation <coughs> Judging Panel. And at the end, we have uh, David Gloucester, who is the Director of Education here at the RIBA uh, and who chaired the, uh, the panels. So the structure of uh, this morning is as follows. Um, each uh, medalist will have up to 15 minutes to present their project, um, and each presentation will be followed by a critique session by this panel for um, five to ten minutes. And rather than have, I think, as is usual, a format where we have a, a debate and discussion at the end, we can do that. I'd quite like to intersperse it, uh, if, if we could, so it's a little bit more uh, interactive. So after we've had a sort of a, a review by the panel, then I will invite some questions from the floor. Um, I'd like to ask Tamsin Hank, who won the 2013 President's Dissertation Medal with her work, Magneto Gore's Utopian Vision of Spatial Socialism, <coughs> Nominated for the awards by the Bartlett School of Architecture. Sounds good. Thank you. The pleasure of going first. <laughs> um, I want to talk to you about um, Magnetogorsk. Um, Magnetogorsk is a city on the far east of the Ural Mountain Range. Oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, and it's a city of about 500,000 people that was built over about five years. Um, in the years from 1929. Um, it had always existed as a place, but a very, very small settlement of about 500 people. Um, and it had been discovered in 1700 as this settlement because there was a military base that was posted just to the north. And the, uh, the people posting this military base realised that their compasses were always being sort of messed about and they couldn't understand what it was. But the reason was that there was this huge uh, reserve of magnetite iron ore forming a mountain range. Um, that they, they discovered using, using magnets. So in 1929, uh, Stalin decided as part of his five-year plan to change the way that Russia was structured, that he wanted to move the economy from agrarian to one based on industry. And the key to this was the idea of mono-industry cities. These would be built around a single industry that would form the basis of an entire new settlement that didn't anymore need to be based in areas because of their defence because of trade, but actually they could be just positioned because of productivity. So this invited this whole new school of thought about what um, urban settlements could be about. And Stalin was really aware of this, and he looked to uh, Campanella's City of the Sun as a utopian settlement uh, that he wanted to kind of promote for, for these new cities. And Magnetogorsk was going to be the poster boy of all these cities. Um, it was, because of the magnetite iron ore, going to be uh, Russia's heart of steel manufacturing. So he launched um, an architectural competition in 1929 um, and key uh, entries to this were by uh, Nikolai Mulitin at the top, Ivan Leonidov and Ernst May. And all three of these uh, 
suggested ideas of the linear city and how this might work to produce a, a city that was all about efficiency, productivity and manufacturing. So uh, Mulliatin looked uh, for these sort of zoned bands of activity that would run along the Ural River. The Ural River separates um, Europe from Asia um, and Magnetical staggers the two sides of this. So they looked at how you might use these kind of zoned activities running uh, in a linear direction to ensure equitable distribution and a, a, an efficient manufacturing society. Um, the bottom, Leonidov furthered this by looking at block uh, formation, that you might create a city using these blocks along a linear uh, expanse that would be able to just keep growing. And then Ernst May, who eventually sort of won this competition, furthered this by looking at how these blocks might then be subdivided into, into quarters, so that blocks might uh, integrate uh, with each other uh, and sort of talk to each other. Now, really important in looking at these ideas of, uh, sort of an industrial urban typology, looking at actually what the intentions were, not just to produce a city that would be efficient, but also to produce a new kind of people that would live in these cities and be a new type of person. And the intention for this was uh, no longer will these people be um, peasants, they will be turned into a, you know, the real proletariat fighting for, for Russia's future. So the ideas of urbanism were looking very much to a kind of industrial typology that looked to use space uh, to instigate a sort of instinctive response in the people that would live in these cities, to make them in a way sort of alienated from each other but also uh, working for this cause. So it kind of, looking at uh, Bentham's panopticon gives us the idea of the way in which space can be used instinctively, whether or not there is a garden or a tundra, people will still act as if there is. Um, and at the bottom, this was very much looked at by um, architects like the duties of the salt works, that whether or not the guard is in the house, people will instinctively react to space in a predictable way. Um, and then this was furthered by um, Owen's New Lanet. And then really importantly uh, for Magnetical is Detroit, and the way in which the city looked uh, with uh, Henry Ford and Albert Kahn about the idea of, of efficiency by using specialised space and how this can be laid out, um, sort of the spatial way of setting out an efficient productive environment. When they were building Magnetical, it was very much in their mind that these cities like Gary, Indiana were being built in the West. And there was this dialogue that was happening. Um, the engineers that were setting out the factory in Magnetical were flown in from America. And a, a lot of this uh, sort of setting out of the city was done by Americans that were very aware of the Albert Khan and, and Ford's work. So the, the beginning of the city very much was shock construction. It started in 1929 and over five years the city went from 500 to 500,000. People were brought in from um, partially forced labour, partially recruitment and, and partially kind of, um, migration into these settlements which were really, really isolated. I mean, the, when people arrived at the train station, they realised that it was in fact just one track leading out in, into nothingness. The initial workforce was really migratory. People came and they were subjected to really quite harsh conditions. This was in the middle of the Siberian steppe with no settlements around it. So I talked to people when I visited there and they were saying that they arrived in the middle of the night and they saw these lights stretching out <coughs> of the horizon. And then in the morning, they thought, Crikey, we've arrived in this amazing new city, it's all built, and then in the morning they woke up and they realised these were just lights out into the steps, like in the way um, into the, the construction site, there was, there was nothing there. So in 1932, um, post drink was introduced, so people were issued with internal passports to stop this internal migration. So actually the city of Magnetogorsk was locked down from 1932 until 1987. Um, so the, the population of this city were fixed in one area. Ernst May, who won the competition, um, designed his, his idea of what the city should be, and they called him and said, right, we want to start construction, come immediately. And when he arrived, they'd already built a super block, but they built it on the wrong side of the Ural River. They lead out the idea of a bridge crossing the Ural. So there was the factory on one side of the city, and then uh, Ernst May wanted to build on the opposite side of the river. 
when he arrived, they'd actually built underneath the factory, so the direction of the wind blew pollution right in. So he stormed out of the city, and <coughs> Ivan Leonidov took over the construction. And he realised very fast that what they were trying to do was well-intentioned, but unsuccessful. And he said the designs of the magnetic force were failing. Basically, what he realised was that people were coming from all these different cultural backgrounds and being forced to live in an um, architecturally homogeneous environment. And they were using the, the new blocks as toilets and storage facilities and camping next to them. Um, so this is the, initial, the uh, final structure of the city. The Ural River runs down the middle with the factory on the eastern bank <coughs> and the right at the top and the Ernst super block just to the south of it here. They then built the bridge over the river eventually because they realised that it was such an a horrendous place to live right in the wind of the factory. So the, the city has been built in this linear arrangement on the, the western bank. Um, so this is a couple of photos of what the city is like now and the way in which the kind of architectural characteristics have really formed a new type of, of urbanism and people that live in it. So these are the block formations and the uh, recreational areas happen internally within the block with uh, residences surrounding them, which means that when you're on public streets, you're very much on the outside space of these blocks. The blocks are so, so large that actually walking between them is very difficult. Some of them are up to a, a kilometre long. So uh, people just nipping into other, other blocks is, is very, very uncommon because it's, it's such a long way. I mean, these are scale comparisons with uh, Manhattan and Chicago, which were built as block cities, but much, much smaller blocks. So people really rely on public transport, but the public transport is built to serve the factory running between the cities. So these east-west streets along the grid serve as a sort of axial route that, that just serves communication between the two. And they also form these visually axial um, importances. So every street ends with a view of the factory that's running linearly opposite to the city. Um, this is one of the uh, initial plans for the, the factory entrance. It would be the city of the, the street of the workers with all of the different workers' accommodation uh, and clubs would then axially face the uh, front of the factory. So they'd be very much aware within the city that there was this relationship with the factory. And this is um, a photograph from, from last year where you see the, the top entrance, this is the furthest north of the city, looking across the bridge and down to the, to the pollution at the bottom. So this, uh, the way that the city was set up has had a very strong impact on the way that the city is today. In 1997, uh, Magnetic City government employed a team of psychologists to come and do a study on what the impact was going to be of global capitalism reaching the city, because they were so worried that the way that the city formed, people were very, very nervous that when capitalism arrived, the city wouldn't be able to deal with it. And actually, it's now uh, voted voted but categorised as one of the 30 most polluted cities in the world and yet it has a relatively stable population of around 400,000 people. People aren't leaving the city. Um, this is partially due to the fact that it's very geographically isolated but partially to do with the fact that they just don't want to. They, they're fine living there. 1% of children are born healthy um, but people don't move away when they're, they're pregnant. These are some people. <laughs> so this is a, a zoning map from uh, 1996 that was due to be realised next year. And what's happening is even in contemporary urban design, uh, new areas are being reclassified at the south of the city as um, residents from agricultural land rather than repopulating these very sparsely populated blocks. They're very much sticking to the grid of the, the linear city that was designed in 1939. Um, you, can, you get to the end of the city and the buildings get more and more modern as you go further south and then they just stop and you see cranes building the next phase of the city in the background. But one thing that has happened was that during privatisation, a single oligarch took control of all of the infrastructure and all of the public uh, buildings that had previously been owned by MMK, which used to be a uh, publicly owned company. So essentially now the city is in a state of a micro-dictatorship, that it was set up around this productive industry for the sake of a, a socialist ideal, but now it's, it's privately owned, so it's kind of this... Uh, neoliberal capitalism has started to creep into the city that has structured itself so heavily around this, um, this structure that it's now perfect for exploitation by, by a private industry. This is the remains of the magnetic mountain from which Magnetogorsk gets its name. There's now five years' supply of iron ore left 
but that's being held in case Russia goes to war and needs to make more things out of steel. So now Magnitogorsk imports its iron ore from Kazakhstan and its coal from the further north. It's in a state where the factory no longer needs to exist. The, project, the product that it makes um, costs more to make than it, than it can sell it for. And there's 400 more of these monocities in Russia, and they're all in a similar state. They were all built in the rush of the 1930s, and they're, because of governmental complacency and a lack of modernising, they're all in a similar situation, and they're posing a great threat to the, the future of Russia, which is so economically based on industry, but on an industry that's so antiquated. <laughs> social phenomenon that you've been writing about. And I, Joseph, um, cities have been at your heart for uh, so many years. How does this sort of sit with your idea of town? Well, it's, I'm not sure it's to do with that, but I, I have actually been involved in planning a city not unlike my winter course, and not far from it, also at the foothills of the Europe. Uh, also abandoned by an industry. In my, in my case, it was a armaments industry. Um, and there the uh, city fathers in their wisdom decided that what they wanted was the Bilbao effect. So they thought they would solve the problems of this city which is being gradually abandoned by its population, like Magnico, Magnico Golf, um, by building a museum of art and a splendid uh, internal transport system and very expensive hotels. Uh, it's at the moment it's at the moment at proof stage, so I one can't tell whether this will be successful. It seemed to be entirely against the sort of way I thought the city might develop. Mm -hmm. And in fact we were sat pretty early on in in proceedings. <laughs> Do you have questions for example? But uh, I was wondering whether in fact it was what the city fathers of Magnitogorsk thought they were, the future was going to be? The future, I think when they, they initially founded it, it seemed like they, they planned it would exist forever. It didn't seem that there was any... No, I meant the city fathers now. Now, now it's actually relatively successful for the sake of the private oligarch that owns the city. Even if the... I think what's happening with Russia at the moment is it's looking east to be able to trade yes. and finding new markets for the metal, the steel that it is producing. It can't import this metal into Europe anymore because it doesn't meet our trading standards. So <coughs> it's going east. And for the, the oligarch that owns the city, it's actually a relatively successful city. And he's reliant on the fact that people aren't leaving. Now, if they did start to leave, then he could face the problem, but actually at the moment he's, he's relatively successful. Um, but it's, it's interesting to think about what the, how this kind of new structure that you say about the Bilbao effect and sort of what's happened in Detroit would be able to retrofit the structure that's already existed because it's, it's not built in a way that it could be retrofitted for that kind of time. But the situation is stable. The, 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 the is, population is stable. In magnetic yeah. yes. But in the, these 300 other ones, there are much smaller monotowns. And there's one, for example, just outside the Petersburg, Pippiovo. And that has no industry left. And it's got about 25,000 people, but no industry to support them. But I think tourism is so difficult because of the transport infrastructure to get there is so important. Alexander, I mean, you're probably closer to this than, than most. Um, I mean, uh, before we've we got any questions for uh, Tamsin, I just wondered whether for people here you wanted to just maybe touch on the process and why you selected this. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, congratulations again in, in person and in public. Um, the, the dissertations uh, panel changes every year. I've been chairing it for two or three years now, I think. And um, we do get a, a great range of very good pieces of work from all around the world. Um, it's, it's a real delight going through them. There's a lot of them, but the overwhelming majority are, are exceptionally good. But I think what the 
priority seems to be without any explicit agenda. I certainly don't set an intellectual agenda, and the judges are selected so that there is considerable variety of background and I would say intellectual thesis. But what has been absolutely del more than delightful, it's been really um, heartening for me, uh, and I think uh, I, I would hope for everyone, is that there seems to be a kind of natural veering of all the judges towards dissertations. How would I put this? That have a, have a relevance. I don't particularly want to call it a sort of social agenda because it might be a little bit too narrow. But, but there is a relevance there. It's not a kind of um, uh, self-indulgent intellectual or other theoretical exercise for its own sake. A, lo a lot of which we've seen a couple of decades ago, I think. So there seems to be a kind of natural turn towards very culturally aware, very ambitious, very poetic often, but ultimately quite relevant uh, studies that talk about the world that we live in and have implications directly or indirectly about how things could get better. Mm. And I think that's, that's a, fantastic, um, a fantastic thing. Mm. So from the initial reading, um, I think I'm trying to... Are there any questions? Are there any questions you... I do. I, I want to raise one issue. I mean, there's, there's an awful lot, and perhaps we need to do this outside this room, uh, that I'd love to discuss uh, with you about this, because it is an absolutely fascinating uh, original piece of research that, that you've done there. But I want to raise one question. I'm not sure if it's a sort of fully a question. What are your thoughts on the idea of utopia? You, you, um, you use the word, and you sort of used it in your, mm -hmm. in your subtext, and you mentioned particularly that it was sort of conceived as a utopia. But it's interesting because it strikes me, well, not only that it's the ultimate dystopia, because that's straightforward, something that starts utopia could end up mm -hmm. being that, but um, utopia is quite a rich word, and I think the way I understand when it was conceived, it has to do with the ultimate efficiency, the ultimate practicality. Does that sit comfortably with the notion of utopia? And the, perhaps the, the utopias that you touched on in your um, uh, the sort of 18th century and 19th mm -hmm. century mm -hmm. visions, isn't it a much sort of narrower version? Yeah, I mean, I kind of used utopia as a way of, of weighing up the idea of the intention and what happens when intention is realised, is it always realised in, in the way that it wants to be, but also as a way of, sort of looking to the future and how it might be reconsidered um, more as a way in which, I mean, I discussed it in the thesis about how um, you might be using sort of a, re a utopia of, of reconstruction, how it might actually be a practical utopia that by allowing people the idea that they have the ability to change the city, kind of opening up the right to the city, you might be able to then enable a sort of, um, the idea that it's possible to achieve something by way of utopia, but as a kind of a practical end goal rather than as a kind of unrealizable dream. That there's kind of scales of, of utopian idea that aren't just this huge swayed scope that then when you realise in the really impractical vision that actually using utopia as a practical way to reopen the right to the city, it might be a way of reconsidering these Can I ask another question? We've talked about the linear development, but you didn't mention the idea of the linear city, which was very much about in Europe mm. at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. Absolutely. Could you go into that? Uh, so, I mean, this, the model that obviously Newton proposed wasn't the first, and he looked at the field radius, he looked at Corbusier, um, looked at the idea that, that this could be a, a way of using a city that had been proposed as a, as a diff with a different intention behind it, and how you might then use that model in a different way. So, I mean, this. European idea of the linear city was very dominant when, when they were proposing these models. And actually they used this kind of very Western idea of, of production in capitalism and um, perfect linear city, but then took that model and used it in a, in a slightly different way. Which is I was thinking specifically of Soria and Mata and the idea course. of the linear city. Yeah, Did that come up? Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm not a disadvantage, you haven't heard um, yeah, of course. I mean, so uh, this is the idea that the city could carry on growing and, and, and propose a model by which the city could kind of continue to expand in the way that it was initially intended. David. Uh, firstly, 
gripping subject. Uh, you're not going to get me dismissing the socialist city as dystopian, by the way. But for me, the heroism and the clarity of the vision is absolutely second to none. And if Western neoliberalism can produce such potent iconography to last so well and persuade 400,000 people that are not going to leave that city, I'll be very, very surprised. If the oligarchs can produce something that actually has the uh, potency, as I say, of, of, of that vision. Um, I think the Western critique of the socialist city is inevitably flawed. I just don't think we ever get uh, the cultural and political circumstances that led to its creation. So I, I, I think that it's easy when one's making a critique of, of, of the mono city that, that, that one overemphasizes the aspects of control and so on, and actually forgets the synergy between building and landscape. And actually, more to the point, you know, the huge difference if you look at um, uh, Soviet industry and Detroit based industry is you go to a Soviet factory, it will have a theatre, it will have a crush, it will have a subsidised canteen, it will actually have a complete programme for the life of the individual and the life of the family, which is entirely absent in the Western model. So there are huge aspects, I think, of the, the constructional and functional and social agenda that don't always get touched on. Yes, of course, there are issues of maintenance and so on. I mean, for me, it's just this question, you know, will, will the next 50 or 100 years see something that has that <coughs> clarity, that, that bravery attached to it? What's your view? Do you have a what, 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 <laughs> I, I, I think it's, it's ambition, and I think someone was saying last night that actually, you know, architects have these really sort of um, optimistic views of what they, what they can produce and the sort of impact that they can have. And I think these cities were actually built with great optimism and hope, and mm. that they would be something very successful. Um, and in the realisation, maybe they have been, maybe it's a different judgment. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, just Hi. Um, I'm not going to touch on utopia, which some people understand. That. But anyway, um, I thought your, t your topic is fascinating and your overview was, was quite comprehensive, it seemed to me. But it was um, largely descriptive. And I imagine that's a result of having to distill it for the kind of presentation you just made. But that's left me very, very curious about um, the conclusions that you've drawn from it and what you want to do with it. And then that, and I'm wondering if you worked at all with Zangetan's We. Do you know the book? I don't know. Because I think Zangetan's We would be a kind of a description of the controlled city from someone from the Finnish who was not happy. Mm -hmm. He lived in Newcastle for a while building uh, icebreakers, but then went back to Russia. For many years, we wasn't published and had to be smart about it. But anyway, I, I encourage you to, to look at, at We, which is a precursor to uh, 1984 and, and Brave New World. But I am very interested to know what the conclusions, you know, what conclusions you draw from the work you've done and what you want to do with it. I mean, principally, I think, given this project took uh, sort of under a year, I was initially, as you say, it's very descriptive because it's, it's a not so much a phenomenon, but something that we're, our media isn't that interested in at the moment, and it's not something that's received a huge amount of um, publication or that has been widely <coughs> looked at. So just as a sort of face value, it has been a really interesting thing to look at these cities and why they were made and what the intentions were behind them and what kind of a state they are in now. But actually, further to that, I think it makes us look um, at what what the way in which kind of we use space or has it has the, the potential to be this really socially manipulative tool, whether that's conscious or not. Um, and I think that's something that I really have, have drawn from that, that this is, makes it sound a little bit grand, but this sort of responsibility, I guess, to acknowledge that that's, that's the position that the architects are in, um, and that optimistic or not, that, that there's, there's kind of this, this thing that might happen as a result of all what's being built. And then how, actually over a relatively <coughs> short span of time, so kind of 50 years to a decade, how things can change as a result of, of political situations, and how building a city with political implications then has a, a time frame, because it's essentially built on something that will move, because the political ideology behind it will change. Um, 
So I guess if you, if you build something that is so instilled in, in politics, how is that then going to change when the idea behind it changes mm. and when the people sort of take, take control of the system? Yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tamsin. I Thank think we, we must move on now. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Design work used in the course of a Part One RIBA Part One qualification or equivalent. Um, the project is called Helsinki Archipelago Town Hall, um, produced by Ness Lafoy from also from the Bartlett uh, School of Architecture. Next. The project I'm going to be presenting today is called the Helsinki Archipelago Town Hall. The building aims to provide a mainland hub for the increasingly isolated residents of the Helsinki Archipelago, which surrounds Helsinki. Finland. Um, its kind of aim is to promote the continued inhabitation of the island. The archipelago around Helsinki is dotted with small pine covered islands. Um, they're extremely unspoiled and beautiful, and many are inhabited by just one or two households. Altogether, there are 455 islands in the Finnish archipelago, and they're home to over 50,000 people. Um, upon visiting the city of Helsinki, it struck me how close the islands are to the mainland and yet how inaccessible they are, despite constantly kind of being in the background of any sort of photograph you take or any, uh, whenever you're walking around the city, really. Um, the vast majority of islanders live without transport links to the mainland and most of the islands lack telephone lines or internet connection, rendering the archipelago a kind of increasingly inconvenient place to live in the modern age. This has led to an influx of islanders moving back to the mainland, back to the city. Um, the main objectives of the town hall then are to provide a mainland hub for these islanders, to host local, national and European scale events and meetings. This is um, to host kind of um, meetings between island council members and to kind of try and um, kind of uh, promote a bit more connection between islands, between the islands and the mainland. It's also to promote the archipelago to tourists and to improve accessibility to the islands. Um, the proposed site for the town hall is in the Helsinki Central Harbour, which is kind of in the map of, um, it's sort of in the middle of Helsinki right there. It's a tourist port, um, and ferry services run to nearby Tallinn, um, but you can't really get many ferry services to any of the islands, which you can see very clearly from the harbour, they just, you just can't really get them. One of the main influences in the design of the town hall is the architectural typology of the houses that are found in the archipelago. Um, many of the dwellings are um, traditional Finnish farmhouses. These are typically timber-framed, pitched roof dwellings, um, often clad in painted wooden shingles. I was kind of mainly interested in the internal layout of these buildings, which are generally um, centred around a huge double-height space in the middle, a kind of communal room from which all of the smaller um, rooms lead off of. Uh, generally dominated by a huge fireplace, a kind of cosy, warm, inviting space. And um, the design of the town hall kind of exaggerates this idea of a tupa, which is um, how, which, what the space is colloquially known as, and um, kind of abstracts the form to create like, a communal clubhouse used by the uh, islanders. Um, the main aim of the town hall is to bring the archipelago into the public conscience, to kind of make it more accessible and easy to inhabit. Um, without detracting from any of its natural beauty or what makes it so unique in the first place. Um, there are three main components to the town hall. The first is the sorting office and um, kind of providing a postal boat service, delivery service to the islands and the archipelago. It would act as an extension to the existing postal service in Helsinki. There's already a similar service and operation in the nearby Turku archipelago and it's been extremely successful. And as a result, the Turk archipelago is much more inhabited <coughs> than the Helsinki archipelago, despite having a similar number of islands and households. Um, the second component to the island is the clubhouse and canteen. This provides a kind of warm lounge for islanders to relax in after a long, treacherous boat journey from the archipelago. Um, this, in some ways, is the Tupa lounge of the town. The third aspect is the accommodation unit which can be used as a base for islanders when visiting the mainland, so a place to moor up overnight and get a good night's sleep. Um, the final aspect is the civic aspect, so the council chamber, which is for use by the island council for meetings, lectures and other cultural events to kind of promote the arts of the archipelago. 
I approached the site by developing um, a fractured landscape in the harbour, which mimics the geography of the archipelago. This kind of gradual fracturing of the landscape extends the public promenade out kind of over the water into the harbour, um, reaching towards the archipelago and creating new public spaces within the city. I used the existing street layout to which um, sort of directs a grid of fixed platforms around <coughs> which components of the town hall are configured. This is the master plan of the town hall. Um, the only part of the town hall which actually sits on the harbour's edge is um, the Islanders Clubhouse and Alcobo Postal Service. Um, from there, the public platforms create a kind of canal system, which is a continuation of the street map um, out over the water, around which the accommodation units float. Out at the furthest point at the end, looking towards the archipelago, is the council chamber. Something which became quite an important idea throughout the project was um, kind of varying levels of stability um, which an islander's lifestyle provides. So these kind of different feelings underfoot, um, kind of different levels of security and rigidity, um, which are subtly mimicked in the surfaces of the town hall. So, for example, the solid kind of safety of dry land is mimicked in the fixed public platforms. The unbalanced nature of a pontoon in the floating walkway, these are the accommodation units, and the units themselves kind of mimicking this buoyant yet stable nature of um, a moored boat, kind of safe environment. Um, these changes in stability also help to kind of softly denote and um, kind of differentiate, I suppose, um, public and private zones within the town hall. This is a kind of um, some drawings of the accommodation units. Um, the accommodation units are intended as small cabin-like spaces for islanders to spend the night on the mainland. The units are designed with a tank system, which allows them to be partially submerged when not in use, and then activated when the islander docks a boat next to them, so the front tanks um, empty of water and the, um, the unit writes itself in the water, allowing it to be accessed by the user. And this kind of rising and sinking creates a constantly fluctuating landscape in the harbour. The rising up of an accommodation unit signifies the presence of an islander on the mainland. And this movement of the units kind of illustrating or communicating the comings and goings of the visitors and the building which is in constant flux. Once a unit is inhabited, outriggers are lowered to increase its stability. These outriggers also provide extra outdoor space. And when the units are inhabited, they can be accessed from the public platform creating um, a sort of temporary residential street and community in the harbour, but one whose inhabitants are constantly changing and kind of swapping around. So city dwellers walk past the front porch of islanders and also islanders can walk into town. It's kind of an intermingling. Um, public platforms lead out to the council chamber, which is intended to host these meetings between the island council and also to hold conferences, lectures and film screenings. Similar to the accommodation units, the council chamber tilts in the water. So when in its flat position, um, uh, shutters are held open on the facade, flooding the space with light, rendering it kind of a good space for meetings. And when needed to be used as a lecture, lecture theatre or for film screening, the, um, the front chamber floods with water, the council chamber tilts slightly, the ropes become slack and the shutters close. Uh, providing good space and nice dark um, break seating for lectures and film screenings. And this is a plan of the um, clubhouse and sorting office, and the only part of the building which sits on the land. Um, it is linked to the source, so the clubhouse is on this side, and the sorting office is out at the end. And that, um, the reason for kind of linking the two together was because I um, spoke to a few people whilst I was in Helsinki, and people really. Um, form quite a close relationship with their postman because if you're the only person living on an island, often the only person you see who's different to your family every day is your postman delivering your newspaper every morning. So um, that was kind of why so the idea of the canteen was a place for not only islanders to go and eat once they'd arrived and spend, spend the weekend in the city, but also a place for the postman to eat. Um, this is um, a long section through the clubhouse and sorting office, um, demonstrating the activity in the building kind of throughout the course of one day. Um, so the post, so starting up at the left there. The post is brought in early in the morning, sorted into three postal rounds to be taken out to the archipelago. Um, it's then loaded into the postal boats and taken out. And as the postman return for lunch in the canteen, islanders are also arriving at the same time and can eat together. Um, and then an evening is spent um, in the two for lunch, um, which is the exaggerated 
tight timber frame space on the first floor of the building. Um, this is the Tupa Lounge. Um, so the vast sort of glazed exterior walls of the Tupa Lounge provide views out to the archipelago and then back over the city of Helsinki, um, flooding the space with sunlight during the long summer days. The lounge is intended as a sort of peaceful space for reading, relaxing, socialising around the fire after a long boat journey or a busy day in the city. Um, throughout the project, I was quite conscious to develop the town hall on a sort of very human kind of personal scale. So what it would actually be like to be the user of the town hall, what would it look and feel like to spend a day there. I did this by following um, kind of characters throughout the design process who would become the users of the town hall. So for example, an islander or inhabitant of the archipelago, a mainland city dweller, a postal worker and a tourist. So here again is kind of a day in the life, I suppose, of the town hall. So starting very early in the morning with the coastal service, then an islander, meanwhile an islander arriving whilst the boats have been taken out, and then eating in the canteen, maybe attending a meeting in the council chamber, and then spending the evening back at the Tupa Lounge. So, um, um, at night the clubhouse sits on the harbour's edge, welcoming any approaching boats. The Tupa Lounge fire lighting up the first floor, and smoke from the wood-burning fire acting as a beacon to approaching visitors. Um, an island arriving after a treacherous journey by boat navigates the canal system upon reaching the safety of the harbour to find an uninhabited accommodation unit to moor up to for the night. The water between the platforms and accommodation units kind of um, acting as waterways and guidance for the boats to pass through. Um, they settle into their accommodation units and unload their boats before heading into the clubhouse to get warm. The islanders, after heading inside, the islanders can spend a cosy evening in the Tufa lounge and meet with old friends and sit by the fire. Thank you. exploration of the, the section particularly. Um, but of course beyond the drawings I guess you know there's a really quite a serious social and geopolitical mm -hmm. agenda that you're following uh, you're exploring here. Um, Joseph, do you have any comments for uh, I'm fascinated by some features of the of the project uh, because the business of tilting seems to me rather expensive uh, in relation to what is gained by it. Well, I don't understand the gain that this expense produces. Well, the kind of original intention was that the building would not be a kind of permanent feature in the heart, which is originally why these units were floating. And then the tilting, I originally intended kind of a the submersion sort of so that um, the harbour can be kind of uh, can regain its natural higher look before. So it's kind of that was the original intention was that it was kind of a quite a subtle uh, sort of presence in the harbour. And then it kind of led on to become this kind of representation of um, islanders sort of showing their presence. So the town hall is really trying to be a kind of a proper sort of representation of islanders on the mainland and kind of really sort of reminding the city in a way that it's uh, out in the home. But I think you're getting it at a great expense. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> probably you just to make whether it's worth it or not, but I think it's, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled by that. Uh, the other thing that puzzles me is why you did it on the mainland rather than on one of the islands. Yeah, um, the reason for that um, really is that um, by putting it out on an island, it's kind of spoiling the kind of natural untold beauty of the archipelago. And by putting it on one individual island, it doesn't really achieve what I kind of wanted it to. So by putting it on the mainland, putting it in the tourist port, it's kind of Promoting the archipelago is another place that one can go and visit whilst there it kind of it really involves the residents of the archipelago in the city. And one of the other problems was that um, when our, when residents of the archipelago come to the city there's nowhere for them to sort of stay overnight and meet together. And so that's why it's on the mainland really, because it's kind of a sort of kind of general meeting point, communal meeting point for all of the islands. Well I'm seduced by the drawings as well, but I'm a bit skeptical about the economy of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we always have this tension, don't we, uh, Joseph, that, of, of trying to uh, instill into the students the importance of resource management, but at the same time, 
you know, just really exploring experience of uh, David, when when on the day of judging when you saw these you know seductive drawings, uh, I mean, it was quite quite remarkable really. And do you have any other questions for next? Uh, it, well it's a, it's very well argued. Um, it, it, it it tells a story. It's obviously going to be useful. Um, I guess the, the questions I had, and I mean to a certain extent, I think we, we, we had them all the day. Although, though I think it it just it just charmed everybody. I have to say. Um, and then over and above that, the the, obvi the obvious utility of it to enhance this idea of archipelago living. I think that's actually the key to it. And, and in a sense, it's the it's the thing I, I've, I've got a question about. That if you're going to uh, look at the idea of something that, that is um, impermanent, um, the boat building. Uh, you know, the benchmark really for me was set by Rossi with the Teatro del Mondo. You know, I was com I was completely sold on on this great yellow and blue thing floating <laughs> down the Grand Canal in Venice, and I still am actually. Although the interesting thing is, inside, like a lot of timber architecture, it's all bent over nails and it's pretty clunky, frankly. And I guess I've got, a, I've got a question which boils down to this thing about the civic, um, which is that um, uh, if we're talking about the town hall, it has certain civic values which um, are about pride and association and defining um, the, a place, in this case the archipelago, as being somewhere that's worth keeping and worth valuing. Um, <coughs> I appreciate that timber's probably the natural thing. Uh, once you set yourself, dare I say, the limitation of referring to the tuba as the source, it tends to condition, um, dare I say, a lack of grandeur. And, and so I guess the question, were you never tempted, if not to make it more grander, at least to make it more sensible? I think it's extremely sensible. And I, I, there's just a sort of element where, frankly, I want to actually, I'm not worried about money. You know, Pulling the irresponsible to say so, but in a sense, I think it needs more extravagance because I think it's about civic value. Yeah. Um, well, I think it was kind of I wanted it to sort of not be a kind of obnoxious, uh, not so obnoxious, but kind of loud building in the harbour and kind of detract or sort of try and force people into this idea of visiting the archipelago or involving it in their conscience or anything. It's more kind of that I wanted to create a space that was kind of slightly reminiscent of what you might recognise as being something native to the archipelago, but placed into the sort of context of the harbour and not trying to kind of become something that overshadows too many of the sort of batch of the harbour, these kind of beautiful buildings, it's sort of quite an iconic view really. And so I kind of thought that it would be perhaps slightly insensitive to build some to design something that was kind of um, take detracting from that, I suppose. Yes, um, I'm very happy with your answer because I, I completely agree with that and um, I, it, it leads me on to actually my question, which might sound superficial but I hope it's actually understood as something more profound than that. Your means or media of representation, everybody praised you about your seductive drawings. But I am a little bit uneasy about, on one hand, what, what seems to me, uh, from what I see, a, a very sensitive, <coughs> very nuanced, very sophisticated, I think, from a brackets, critical regionalist kind of point of view, but, you know, so the sensitivity argument, you know, I buy completely something that feels that it, you know, could have always been here. The materiality of it, the timber, perhaps the kind of slightly more homemade feel as opposed to something that feels, in most which the project talks about. Yet your media that you chose to represent have a very, very, very different kind of communicate communicate something very differently. They have this kind of flattened pop aesthetic. Yeah. And they also, apart from some very final drawings which are still fully computerized without any reference to the one that time, um, but certainly everything before, is completely decontextualized. This extraordinary landscape that you're building and that you're drawing the sensitivity of the materials and the space and so on from, and the cultural mores and manners, is not there. And I'm, I'm sure that's deliberate because there's a very clear kind of 
uh, public leaflet, public education leaflet aesthetic to this. So I, I don't know. I mean, is, do you have something to say about this? Um, strikes me as well. Yeah. Well, I think I didn't kind of set out um, originally thinking oh, I'm going to do all of these things in a kind of cartoony style or in a kind of flat style. It's something that kind of develops as I was signing the town hall. So I was quite daunted at first by the kind of tasks that I set myself with these kind of different components that I was trying to bring together. So I think it kind of and that's when I started to kind of introduce the idea of the characters, the different groups of people, and trying to sort of zoom in on a more personal level. And the way that I was kind of drawing and sketching out the building kind of lent itself to this kind of sequence of events, so a sequence sort of a single person using a certain part of the building, sort of zooming in really far and then zooming back out again to the master plan. And I just kind of, it kind of lent itself quite well to this sort of um, cartoon strip, I suppose. So it wasn't really intentional at the beginning, I, uh, but it, I think that's kind of why I did it. It was because I think I wanted to tell kind of a full story of the building. And so Just as a, sorry, uh, did it feel that it distanced you a little bit in the end? The narrative, the storytelling might have distanced you from the actual place, the landscape that is not conveyed as strongly as perhaps it could have. Uh, yeah, perhaps. I mean, perhaps it would have been sort of beneficial. Also. I think maybe I focused too much perhaps on the island of and the kind of use of the building that it's built for, sort of thing. But uh, maybe it would have been more beneficial, I don't know, I'd like to go back and do is to focus perhaps on the point of view of a resident of Helsinki and what kind of impact this building being built in the harbour would have on them. And that perhaps would be a way to get some of the external concepts back in. For me, I thought that the, the drawing kind of captured that spirit, the spirit of the narrative. That was a, a thing that attracted me to the, to, the, to the technique and the drawings. Um, um, are there any questions for Vanessa? Two things. I admire your statement, but picking up on the picking up on the discussion about the way it's presented, I don't believe that sky in Helsinki is quite like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there could be a much more precise attention, not to in a sense making an image, but actually testing what the quality of that space is and the light yeah. and the material. Actually to do it. You know, the techniques are available. So I think this is, this is, if you like, a gloss on an idea. The other one is just thinking back to being in Helsinki in January and seeing the harbour frozen over. There are whole issues about climate that you could be responding to. And I think there is, a, for quite a long time, there's been an interest in making buildings move in order to respond. Yeah. I tend to believe that generally buildings don't have the room in order to respond. And the final comment is, is there are all those little civic spaces made by Alvarado with incredible care for tiny rural communities, but he actually makes space between the buildings, and the buildings contribute to that space, which is an unbelievable civic space. So there's a kind of tradition there. So these are all overlays on wonderful work, but maybe something to think about. Would you like to comment on that? I mean, particularly um, on the clim climatic response. Yeah, so um, the kind of, sort of a, a thing I kind of didn't really mention actually is the kind of, uh, kind of a sort of larger scale thing with the town hall is that there would be a larger ferry service introduced, a kind of more regular ferry service to some of the smaller islands. Which it, there's currently an icebreaker ship that breaks up, supposed to break up the, all the ice in the harbour in the winter out as far as the sort of third island out of the harbour. So the kind of extension of these services is kind of an idea that um, on the building of the town hall, perhaps more routes would be cleared to these islands. Because I mean, most of these islands are really far out and it's inaccessible for sort of three months of the year. Um, so kind of the idea of the town hall was that it could uh, render these places perhaps more accessible in the winter. So which obviously is something that at the moment isn't entirely possible, but the perhaps um, building of something of a centre like this could perhaps accommodate. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to uh, move on now to our uh, third and final presenter, the 2013 President Silver Medal for the best design work produced in the course of RIBA Part 2 qualification, or the equivalent. And this went to Ben Hayes, also from the Bartlett School of Architecture, who's going to present his project, Kizzy Island. I, so the project is titled on Kiji Island um, and the proposal is for a museum landscape that 
uh, seeks to facilitate the restoration and protection of over 200 wooden Orthodox churches in Russia onto Kiji Island in the Republic of Korea and Northern Russia. Uh, in the next 10 to 15 years, currently, uh, a, a large majority of, of these churches <coughs> almost have disappeared. And that's really due to uh, lack of maintenance, lack of funding, and also due to that rich history um, which has led them to be in the position they're in. The project really developed out my initial research into uh, the Russian landscape and national identity. And I was looking at different influences from romant romanticism in the late 19th century to the wide scale impact of Soviet occupation, collectivization of state run farms in rural areas, um, to the current deruralization and impacts of urbanization. Um, looking for that research, what really gripped me was um, landscape painting, and in particular, this landscape painting by Isaac Levitan, uh, painted in, 19, in 1894, um, which is really one of the most famous depictions of the Russian landscape still today. And really, what I was fascinated by, which is kind of researching and looking into this image by Levitan, is that it was highly constructed. Um, like many of the paintings of that time, even by the Perevichniki. Um, and this idea of landscape that Levitan was trying to sell was really a highly constructed. Um, and in this image, the church was taken from one place, the lake from another, and the landscape was really kind of fabricated around that to get this sense of sublime sereneness of the Russian landscape of architecture and landscape and, and religion. Um, so I was interested in this separation between uh, this kind of scenographic, aestheticized approach to an idea of landscape and actually kind of the, the reality and the, a more dialogical approach um, to landscape. So I looked at uh, these images by Believing, and again, highly constructed, um, a diff completely different style, but um, again, kind of finding a glory within, within the Russian landscape. So I started looking at uh, kind of the rich history in the layer found in some of these paintings and um, how they actually dictated how the Russian people thought of their landscape. Um, and many of these paintings travelled between cities um, and small imagery. Even today, you could go, you can walk through Moscow and they'll have kind of over graffiti, they'll have these kind of mocked up canvas paintings, these some, some similar paintings. Um, so the imagery is still very rich. Um, so looking over, the, in particular, the Russian north, and as I said before, the influence of collectivization and state-run farms, um, I was fascinated how, how these two different stories um, were kind of running simultaneously, um, especially the, the latter was not really being shown um, eventually today. Um, and currently, this is the situation surrounding the, the Russian north. Um, there are many, as a result of, of collectivization of state-run farms, um, a lot of areas have uh, farms have been kind of killed out, um, and there are many churches, over 200 in the Russian North, that are in a very similar position to this one. Um, there's no one left to maintain them because these farms have been been run out. People have been moved to the cities, urbanisation. Yet yeah, there's very little that's been done to preserve them and protect them. So. As a proposal, I was, I was really interested in trying to create some sort of architectural intervention that could facilitate the protection and restoration of some of these churches. Um, and I was kind of poised with, with the question of do, do you kind of restore them in the situation they're in, or are, is, is that kind of too late? And the areas they, they're kind of in, in the remote north, there's no one to maintain them, so you could restore them, but the same thing. These, these churches are, are timber and they're under a constant state of maintenance. They're constantly being, you know, roofs, a couple of stones, they're constantly being restored. They need a lot of maintenance. So I started doing a series of surveys around the area and looking at all the different um, areas and churches that <coughs> could possibly be, um, be restored and looking at a method of disassembling them and shipping them to a specific site and reassembling there where they could, where so it could be used as a repository to, to restore them, to facilitate them, um, to exhibit them, and give them a new life. Um, so the site became Kiji Island. Um, Kiji Island already has a few uh, wooden Orthodox churches and a few other wooden, Orthodox, um, wooden buildings that have been disassembled and reassembled for their protection in the 50s. 
Yeah. Since then, not really much has been done to the rest of the churches outside, and it's kind of become this haven, uh, this small open air museum where these churches are kind of restored not particularly well. Um, but there's this growing gap between this kind of aestheticized version of the past, which is on the island, and then the reality of what's going on with all the other 200 churches and communities that are losing their churches. Um, so my project, uh, my proposal kind of started looking at other open air museums, this is a series of studies of other open air museums around the globe and how they have grown um, and what are the, mo the more successful ones are the ones that have adapted and they have they've had a dialogue with uh, the existing area and buildings and um, uh, different types of artists have been brought in and given back. And the least successful the ones are the ones that have kind of become stagnant and and don't really respond to the world around them. They've just become this kind of um, archive that, that, that has no dialogue to it, to, to the surrounding areas. Um, so I began collecting a lot of data for these churches from the surrounding um, areas of Russia, from Murmansk, Archangel, and Karelia, um, and started looking the way in which they're constructed. And the beauty about how they're constructed is that. Uh, the high level of craftsmanship, they'll only use one axe and they're all slotted together. So there is an ease to disassemble and reassemble them. There are no nails, there are no, the joints are, kind of, are very specific to, to slot in from kind of, uh, bottom up. Creating a survey, I was looking uh, three dimensionally, but I was also looking in, in sectional form um, and looking at uh, what type of architectural interven intervention I need on the island to bring all these parts of churches onto the island by ship and to reassemble them, restore them, uh, research them, protect them. And what type of architecture would, um, would allow for that? So I started uh, doing a typological survey of all these church forms, and this is uh, one of them, um, to try and find an architecture that would uh, be appropriate uh, onto this island that um, would be very much informed by the things they're restoring. And I designed a series of buildings, the first being uh, uh, these restoration hangars, which um, in total there's five of them, and the design which is very much based on uh, cataloguing all the different churches um, I proposed to bring onto the island to be restored, um, and then dividing them in types, so you have five different hangars di uh, custom built to a specific uh, type of church based on their form. Um, and the architecture was purely informed by, by the form, um, by the church within them. And this idea actually came from um, uh, a story I heard when I was on Kiji Island, which was you know, this 16th century church that was needed to be restored um, it, over the winter because the roof came in. Uh, and what they, what they devised was to build another church outside it. Um, it no longer exists, but um, that was kind of the precedent for, for this kind of development in this kind of language and style. So essentially you have some sort of outer skin which is very much almost like a nave of a church but it's um, really designed for the restoration and that and the roofing um, while, while this process goes on. Um, the roof is also uh, habitable for the craftsmen but uh, in the future I, the, kind of the proposal plans to, as all these churches brought on, the tourism will be increased and there will be more revenue to, to fund these churches so that the visitor can come and actually inhabit these roofs around the, kind of the restoration process to be more engaged with the church. Um, so it's kind of looking at two scales, and the top sketch um, was again looking at these kind of small specific buildings where they're dealing with the restoration, whether it's for the outside of the church or it's for the internal like on the um, or ceiling painting. And then the bottom sketch looking at a larger scale of getting new materials in, where to store old materials, um, and what's happening to these, to these churches as they're brought onto the island, how, how are they exhibited on the island. Uh, so this is um, the island, about five, five and a half kilometers long, um, a situated restoration facility up onto the uh, northwest, um, purely because of uh, that, that's where shipping routes already exist. It's quite deep there and it's quite shallow on the island. Um, but, the, but the layout is to, have a series of um, restoration hangars that will allow these, um, all these materials and artifacts to come off the boat onto these, um, onto these docks to be restored. They kind of maintain a liminal quality um, 
to allow for this, and then they're brought through onto the island in parts um, to further uh, research centres, um, laboratories for human painting, and a, a permanent museum on the island uh, section through one of those hangars. So the architecture is very much informed by the process that I was setting out in the strategy to, to try and restore these so many churches in such a short period of time. Uh, so this is one of this is one of the icon workshops and archive, um, which seems to be fully contained because of the ceiling paintings icons are much more fragile, um, especially to the weather. And there's also a series of uh, temporary buildings um, that I, I began designing, which will also facilitate um, the kind of the maintenance around the island. Seeing that the, the hope is to curate all these churches. <coughs> around like from, from the north to the south um, in some sort of flexible arrangement um, permanent and temporary structures will be necessary. Um, so the next stage of the process was thinking about well, if once these churches are bought and restored what, hap what happens with them. And when I visited Key Island my first impression was um, in awe and uh, of such beautiful architecture. But also this, there was a kind of there was a kind of false sense of the picturesque that had been created. And since the 50s, these churches, these few buildings that are existing on the island, they were arranged by by two men at one point in time, and they're kind of now there's, which was very much based on kind of a picturesque approach that they they you know they thought a church here, a church here. No really thought of what happens when more churches come on. So what you really get is this kind of mishmash of all these churches from different locations, but they're kind of fixed in this specialised kind of version of the past um, without kind of possible future curation. Um, so my approach to the island was thinking once these churches are on, can I create a kind of a light infrastructure which will allow which will treat the island as kind of a blank exhibition space where an ongoing curation process can um, can be achieved over a large period of time and if churches are brought on and restored and exhibited, some might be permanent because they have no home to go back to, but some might stay there for a period of time and then be disassembled and put back to their original locations. So I was looking at the timeline process, um, predominantly in a series of drawings, um, and also looking on the large scale kind of master plan of the island um, and how this curation process might work without prescribing exactly where all these uh, artifacts might go, but kind of increasing the chance and the possibility that perhaps these churches you know, set of buildings might be um, disassembled and reassembled in their original arrangement location, or perhaps they could be arranged chronologically. Is this like a conventional indoor museum that would have a temporary and permanent, permanent collections? Um, so I was also looking at it um, seasonally um, and how that might affect uh, tourist patterns, and looking again at a large, larger scale kind of light infrastructure will allow this uh, flexible curation of an open-air museum. Some uh, imagery of, again, speculating one way in which these churches could be stored for a period of time, um, permanently or temporarily. The project is, kind of became as much strategical as it was lyrical, um, whilst providing a commentary on the current state of these churches. Um, this image is of uh, the approach, so in the, in the winter the lake freezes over, Lake Onega freezes over. Um, and again, looking at the different types of approach uh, for the tourists and for the visitor onto the island. Um, and with, with the architecture that I was producing, I kind of wanted to, in terms of materiality and form, I still wanted to, want that to be very much informed by, by the buildings that are being put on the island. So I was looking at pitch pine and um, aspen, for, which is locally sourced from the mainland. Um, so I was looking at a variety of scales um, and medium models doing different surveys and drawings, um, which is really informing the project. Um, and now currently, um, now working on a project um, which has kind of been off the back of, of my thesis work to work at a scale one to one. Um, and I'm collaborating with uh, a charity would not touch at risk and a few um, people from, from Russia and from the UK um, to, and the aim of the project is to increase awareness of, what's, of, of what we might lose in 15 years. Um, and the Russian art project is to, 
The idea is to prefabricate um, Levitan's church, which has been um, lost for about 200 years now, and prefabricate it in northern Russia and reassemble it here in the UK, um, potentially in London and throughout, and almost similar to close thing, kind of the tin tabernacle, having this prefabricated church that can actually move around and have exhibitions and conferences and awareness, but to really, um, again, highlight the, the awareness for, for what's happening in Northern Russia um, and try and make a change. Um, and these are just some drawings, some uh, early paintings that we're attempting to use to, be, to reconstruct the chapel. Thank you. Thank you. mentioned that this was uh, probably an unusual uh, year in which uh, all the medals went to one school of architecture, the Barclay <coughs> School. Uh, I, I, has that ever happened before, David? No. No. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure the strength of the school. Um, but, but going back to uh, Ben's uh, project, Joseph, I was intrigued about its, its notions of Preservation and heritage and, and context. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Ben? Well, I was wondering, are the islands now completely depopulated? So, are the islands completely depopulated? Uh, Fiji Island has a very, very small population, about 12 people at the moment. And what did what did they live fishing? Uh, or, or they they work basically for for the existing museum there. Yeah, I see. Okay, so they're on tourist industry. Yeah. Yeah rather than either fishers or less cultivated. Yeah. 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 The conditions are very harsh. And uh, people just left. I think it's just a, one of those interesting problems of depopulated and yet built up areas. Um, I suppose there are no, there's no way of considering Repopulating uh, the islands with other than restoration industry. Um, I think for, for islands that are closer to cities such as Petrus of Oz, but um, for predominantly for where these churches come, the majority of them are kind of far in the kind of either up in the Arctic Circle or, or really far in the, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and in those, for those areas, can't really fight, you know, the depopulation, derealization, people are moving away from that. Um, and that's had a long impact from um, Soviet occupation. Did they ever serve a population? Was there a large population the islands? Uh, the island, no, the island um, has a long history. It used to be a uh, site of pagan worship. Um, and it was always kind of seen as a, a kind of a sacred space of gathering. But, um, with a small population, but it was never, never overly populated. Um, so yeah, I think it's always, it has always been seen as a place of gathering, um, and that whether it's through religion, um, whether it's kind of slowly become this kind of museum. I'm sorry, Dave. Questions for that? Uh, <coughs> thank you. It, it's along the same line actually, and I want to start by saying that I think it's an extraordinary project, and there's, there's no doubt that, um, I mean, already you're doing something off the back of that, I think, uh, very appropriately. But I want to challenge a little bit um, some of the things that you said and the nature of this project, which, all things said and done, might end up being, you know, the only way forward, a kind of mini Bilbao effect for the Fiji Island, but something it sort of bothers me a little bit because you were very eloquent in your critique about the picturesque, the aestheticization, but then you're proposing a museum and curation which are absolutely aestheticizing and objectifying and decontextualizing those things that we're trying to preserve. And of course this could very well be the paradox of you know our late modern condition. But I wonder since very appropriate and sensible as this project is, it is ultimately a, a school project. If there was a way of thinking 
around it, and rather than proposing ultimately a museum and something that targets a kind of more temporary and um, eating, I can't think of the word, so you know, one minute it's here, the next day it isn't, type of industry, which is the tourist industry, <clears throat> if you might have thought around it in terms of perhaps setting up a, a school for restoration or workshops that perhaps begin to give incentives around those churches, but begin to give incentives for people to perhaps move permanently there, or at least seasonally. Mm -hmm. um, that is something I considered. Um, and to an extent, in, in, in the plan, there is there are kind of um, accommodation for students to come on, and that's why I was trying to call a research facility, a restoration facility, where, where international you know, research can be done on these buildings as they're coming in, and these different specimens are coming in. Um, yeah, it was uh, from doing this initial research into landscape and scenographic approaches with that logic, I did come to this, this paradox of. Um, and it was really negotiating between one and the other. Um, you know, the main fact is what do you do with, with all this heritage? Do you, do you just select a few, or um, when I'm bringing onto the island, what, what, what happens to them? So <coughs> I guess I was trying to do a bit of everything and, and have, have exhibition, have kind of a tourist industry built up around it to, um, to finance the actual restoration of so many churches. Um, but I guess I was trying to be careful and saying, well, actually, you know, this, this museum is actually is, is temporary. Um, and having these, having these churches on the island for a period of time, they might, they might go back and they might find new, new uses, which might be even more um, uh, evocative. You know, it's a long history of these uh, churches, especially during Soviet occupation, to have different functional programmatic use. They were used as clubhouses, they were used as cinema. Um, not suggesting maybe that that's the use of them, but that was also one stage I'd probably invite like to explore as well. Is that um, you know we have these buildings if they've been decontextualised, okay, they've been de being physically decontextualised, but they've been de already been decontextualised because there's no one using them. Yeah. And okay, they're placemakers and they're very you know they're very inherent um, to the situation they're built in. But if there's no one to use them, well then you know they've already been brutally decontextualised. Why can't they have new uses? Um, why can't they have new locations and find new meanings? Um, so, yeah, there was kind of a lot of things that I, I guess I could have done, and I was trying to kind of um, marry up the, the reality with, um, with my initial research and my initial kind of opinions. Okay. Well, Ben, I, I think it occurred to me when you were speaking that actually all three of the projects that we've been discussing today deal with flight or the potential for flight from established communities. I mean, they treat it all in different ways, but interestingly, that's, that's the theme. And I, you know, just for the benefit of the audience, there was no conferring between juries. They took <laughs> place on separate days in separate rooms with separate individuals. But um, I, I think the point Alexander made a little bit earlier about um, um, an agenda which is essentially a social agenda um, emerging, I think, is something that I've noticed over the course of the last five to six years in the Netherlands. It's become very prevalent. Uh, personally, I think this is a, a good thing. Um, Architecture is losing its way at a rapid speed of knots in terms of its divorce from the social agenda and its embrace of marketization. Um, there's, a, th there's something that, that I have to ask about, which is that essentially you're dealing with relatively small to medium scale artifacts, these extraordinary churches produced with a, a single axe and with no incredibly sophisticated technology that, that's demountable and reconstructable. Um, in a curious kind of way, the, the element that you introduced, the hangar, five big hangars, um, which kept echoing in my mind as being like those timber airship hangars you know, that were produced in the southern states of America at a particular time. Um, they don't get as much of a referency, in a sense, as to what they are. Because you've got the aestheticised past of this new city of churches that you produce. What's the future of the hangars? I, I, I was struggling sometimes, much as I like them, I instinctively like them, but I can't quite know why. And I couldn't quite identify what they were, and actually how they sat in the, um, the future of Kiji Island, which incidentally I think will turn into holiday homes for oligarchs. So, you know, after they've made their money and they need their divorce, they can get to the <laughs> um, 
That's all in, so, I mean, the architecture itself came from a lot of precedent. I was, I was looking at, you know, docks, and I was looking at um, Chatham Dockyard, I was looking at um, uh, Wellesley uh, Yacht House in New York. Like, is, I mean, that was more of a, a kind of a, a practical solution of having a lot of timber coming onto the island. How would you have that? I guess that's why they kind of kept a liminal quality um, as a kind of gateway in and off the island. Um, and there is a kind of civic side to that of, of kind of having this ongoing kind of artifacts kind of going through. And then at one point it kind of became very industrial. Um, but it was, it was they were really set by the parameters of having, say, 15 years for a large majority of the come through. Um, in the kind of future of them, um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to say a lot of them would stay there because a lot of these churches are kind of under a constant state of maintenance. They, you know, they don't just get to come in and, 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 and fix and go out and, and that's it. But it's an ongoing process, and that's why I thought kind of a facility, a research facility, was quite <coughs> interesting because um, approaches to heritage and stuff are going to constantly change in the way in which um, the technologies they use to restore these churches. Uh, now they, you know, they still have the, the old the axe, but you know, historically so they have new kind of new type of technologies um, developing that. So I, I, I saw it as a permanent um, facility um, uh, that that will remain there, you know, throughout, throughout a, you know a, period, a long period of time. I mean, the heritage is what we would say. Well, actually, the ends justify the means. Uh, we've uh, we've solve this problem of restoration. Um, I think the question, I mean, it's alluded to earlier, I think Joseph made, this question about repopulation is actually fundamental. You know, that's the next strategic question that has to be asked. Because it begs the question, I think, about all heritage projects. It's interesting, David, I, because I'm in, in not necessarily searching for a thing, but I was very aware of that, the, the, the social dimension to, to each of the, and, and I'm, I'm sort of, Recall, um, I think it was a few years ago now, when um, I think it was a, a, a Building Futures report that was done by um, uh, by the Building Futures Group, which which was making the case for um, um, architects to rediscover that social thing. So I think it's really quite quite an interesting point of view. But I think the other thing, which the theme that uh, uh, occurred to me was that this um, interrogation of the the, the the sort of historical context of the brief, and, and I just wonder whether you'd like to, the panel would like to comment on that. That seems to be another theme, um, the sort of awareness of the, of, of the historical. Joseph? Well, no, I, perhaps I should say that I was sedu very seduced by the ruins of this project. Um, if the, the, the problem of the timber churches in the north of Russia has always been a terrible problem because they need constant attention. Uh, that kind of infrastructure does uh, rotten places that uh, um, it's not always very carefully constructed um, so there are occasional building failures but basically I think David's point is the fundamental point when as an architect you deal with this kind of situation is what is going, who is going to look after them and what is going to be the population that is going to occupy this particular area <coughs> and what are they going to live on? Uh, are they just going to live on constant restoration, constant attention to the buildings and the tourist trade? Oligarchs don't have a very long life, I'm trying to put it that way. Um, so, you, uh, the whole situation of property, the social situation in Russia will change. The uh, and what then? Can't, you can't, obviously you can't plan for that because it's an unknown. But you can, as it were, further the next step. And that's not quite, um, not quite foreseen in this project. Um, maybe it can't be. Um, really following on from Joseph's point, one of my concerns, although I, I love the skin and 
uh, debate. One of my concerns is perhaps the missing issue is there is no political vision. And two particular schemes which have similarities with this come to mind. One's in Austria, I think it's near Selva, where there's a whole part of a hillside dedicated to Austrian farmhouses that go back a thousand or more years. And there's farmhouse after farmhouse after farmhouse. The other example is St. Pagans near Cardiff, uh, which has got a whole wealth of, of wealth buildings that have been restored and converted. The Austrian example is an inventory. It's an archive. It's a scholarly approach to the issue of what is an Austrian farmhouse. Whereas St. Pagans in Cardiff was developed with a political issue in mind, and that was to reinforce the evolution and the development of Welsh society. And the whole driving force behind St. Pagans is the social agenda. Now, my argument would be that that is a much more sustainable approach to this type of restoration than one which is purely archival and dependent essentially on sponsorship. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree to an extent that when I was doing you know, research into other open air museums, which are, you know, some are contained museums and some are, you know, uh, within communities and with towns, they're part of it, integrated. Um, and that was one thing I was slightly uneasy about, and I was kind of using the term aestheticized versions of the past. You take an open air museum like in Williamsburg, it was very much based on ideals of nationalism that are kind of outdated now but it's this physical manifestation that is, hasn't really adapted to that. Um, and they've been, they're very struck, they, they have been struggling to adapt, to, you know, to accommodate the, the change of society. Um, and I guess, this, you know, to an extent, this is an archive, um, but I was trying to uh, maintain a, de a kind of degree of flexibility on the island, how, without kind of, without, describing, you know, people will have it this way or it will be curated this way to try and kind of stand back and say, well, what, what kind of solution can I provide to create something that's very kind of, has maybe a light infrastructure um, which will allow ability to, to move in either way. And, that, that, you know, you could argue that's just stepping back and allowing it to happen. But um, <coughs> there's one thing I was very uneasy about and still on the island now that these, they, these festivals they have they have to kind of, I think, once a year on the island, um, are all about nationalism. Um, and they're, they're, they're let down for the Ministry of Culture. And the new director of the museum is she just dropped down from Moscow, whereas before it was someone kind of local in Karelia. Um, which, for me, I guess, the Western I felt very uneasy about um, using, using its architectural heritage um, as a particular kind of currency of culture um, in a political way. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Any further questions for that? Yeah, um, I have a few comments. I, I love the way you've done this project. I really love what you're, you're attempting to do. But without going to use of the she's just kind of <coughs> analogy. It's like a, you know, building a mechanics restoration shop and having a kind of used car lot at the, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's for me a, a very it raises a very weird question that, that I think we have to address because I think the mechanics of what drives this kind of project is that we must restore everything that has been. Now, the, uh, what draws us to, to, to what's really interesting about this project is, is the aesthetics of decay, that it's kind of fallen apart. And I think that's probably what drawn you to that, that project and the, the beautiful photograph that you had. You know, kind of weird though it might sound, it's beautiful that it's, it's, it's all kind of fallen apart. Now, I wonder whether the project could have been a curation of, of, of the decay of these churches rather than <coughs> the creation. Because you're not really restoring the liturgical space or the communities or any of that sort of stuff. You know, it's just the restoration of the building. Mm. But yeah, how I came across to us were, was through imagery, and it was through photographs. And as you said, photographs of this kind of, of a romantic kind of idea of this kind of church that will kind of remain in this state forever because it's, it's been documented. Um, and I actually met the photographer, um, Richard Davies, and he published a fantastic book of all these churches, and he spent nine years surveying them as they are, and they are all in these kind of states of decline. Um, and he said himself, he said, well, you know, I've got nothing to photograph now if they were restored because people wouldn't, you know, people wouldn't, they wouldn't sell that idea. Um, but the reality, the reality is you can't, I mean, how you maintain a, a structure that is kind of, I guess it's the argument you restored, you preserved, you conserved, 
Um, and that's uh, kind of one point I came to it in kind of a uh, fork in my project. It was like, what do I pre do? I preserve them? Do I restore them? Um, especially, you know, some of them carry um, scars of Soviet, as I said, Soviet occupation. They have graffiti in them. They've had, they've been um, modified and appropriated to become clubhouses. Um, so, how do you restore them? Do you, do you preserve them back to their former glory, as kind of um, portrayed in Levitan's painting, or do you do you accept that? And you, you know, and for me, I would say I would, I would say actually, if it was if it was an institute of Preservation, maybe it should be into preservation, restoration, and conservation, and actually all those things should be drawn together because no no one is right and no one is wrong. Um, so I mean, I guess I guess that, I mean the decision I took was to, to I guess to allow for that. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. we need to conclude now, but I, I just wanted to uh, say one of the, I think the two particular delights in any uh, presidential year um, is the uh, uh, presidential medals and, um, and, and the Royal Gold Medal, and bringing the two together on an occasion like this is uh, it's just a, a, a really lovely experience for, for, for a president. So um, I wanted to uh, thank uh, uh, Tamsin Ness and, and Ben for your presentations. Um, thank you to Joseph for more this evening uh, when the gold medal, Royal Gold Medal will be presented to Alexander and, and, and David and, and thank you to all for, for coming um, this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.